on Beyond 2000, survival food for soldiers. Sea otters move house to survive. And in the United States, the world's most powerful computer. Hello, and welcome to the final Beyond 2000 program for this series. Later in the show, a preview of commuter flying in the 1990s. But first, two French horses which changed the course of motoring history. What does a car need to be successful? Speed, comfort, luxury, prestige or power? Well, this is a car that has none of that, yet it's one of the great triumphs of automotive history. There are cars made for motoring and cars made for driving. And for anyone who really enjoys the pleasures of motoring, they don't come much better than Citroën's 2CV, the Deux Chevaux. It's been a great success for more than 40 years. Before it, there was nothing quite like it. And sadly, there'll probably be nothing like it ever again. For after five million models, Citroën has decided that production of the French 2CV is to come to a close. True, the Deux Chevaux is no beauty, but somehow that's quite irrelevant. No air-conditioned cocoon this. Its advantages are in what it lacks. No distributor, no radiator, no hoses, no head gasket, virtually no roof. Early models didn't even possess an ignition key. It's a 1930s definition of the useful minimum in motoring, and it's lasted beyond all expectations. The 2CV actually began its life in the mid-30s. The plan was to build a car that would be disgustingly economical. A car that would put everybody on wheels. But with the war's interruption, it was years in the making. Designing a very simple car proved to be a very complicated task. Its looks disguise a remarkably sophisticated machine, which, as we'll see, is still influencing car design today. Take the suspension, for instance. Citroën called for a car that could transport eggs across a field without breaking them. The result was independent suspension that links the front to rear, allowing it to navigate quite awful agricultural back lanes with ease. But the designers could never have expected their ugly duckling would become a status symbol. Somewhere, somehow, it was discovered for its style, not its utility. The 2CV became a romantic image of France exported across the world. The 2CV has earned an astonishing collection of honours and achievements. In Europe, it even became a racing machine, all 29 horsepower of it. If nothing else, it proved beyond doubt the car's durability. Imagine having the job of redesigning a car that had sold for 40 years and had been produced literally in the millions. Well, it might be slightly easier to try and reinvent the wheel. But for Citroën, it meant an absolute return to the basics of motoring. And it had its genesis in a design concept called the Eco de Mille, the Eco 2000. The Eco 2000 is a pointer to the Deux Chevaux of the next century. It's Citroën's response to a challenge from the French government to produce a useful car with an average fuel economy of just 3 litres per 100 kilometres, about 95 miles per gallon. Once again, the company questioned all the conventions in an effort to reduce drag, weight and increase efficiency. It's an all-new car, but the pedigree is unmistakable. The challenge was met using ideas like plastic wheels and a super thin windscreen. After six years research and nearly 90 million dollars, half of it from the French government, the Eco 2000 taught Citroën a lot about what its new production small car should be. The 2CV was launched with a small press release. 
but the new generation small Citroen, the AX, got a slightly more grand delivery. It combines lessons from both the Dershavo and the Eco 2000, with the most sophisticated market research ever undertaken by a car maker. And for good reason, this car could well make or break the company. The AX is certainly a handsome car with many innovations. Its pedigree is beyond reproach, and early sales are encouraging. But a 2CV? Well, it's not. Even the man who oversaw the AX design is at a loss to explain the ugly duckling's success. It's true that the Dechevaux has a magic and mystery, but as an engineer, that's not really what's important to me. My role is to live with my time, and if the Dechevaux was a success, even if we can't put a finger on it, what's important for us is that the AX is just as great a success as the Dechevaux was in the past. Somehow Citroën seems a little embarrassed about the continued demand for the 2CV. They've been forced to continue production in a small factory in Portugal. It just doesn't seem to fit the image of a modern car company. Today Citroën pushes the image of high technology, even if it means using humour like this to show how important computers are to the company. But computers didn't create the 2CV, and one wonders if they could. The days of cars that last for several decades seem gone forever. Three models that represent well over half a century of motoring technology. The past, present and future of a great car maker. But as Citroen has found, sometimes we need to look back to find the way ahead. And after the break, the way ahead in food. Later in the show, London's new inner city airport. Unfortunately, too often the importance of food in the soldier's kit has been underestimated. If an army does indeed march on its stomach, then it's a wonder the soldiers of the American Revolution were even able to go into battle. Their flatulence must have been astounding. It was in 1775 that minimum army rations were established by congressional resolution. As well as carrying his weapons, ammunition and bedding, this soldier's ration issue was bulky and not very nutritious. Yes, I don't think I would have been in great shape after this, Carmel. A pound of beef, a pound of bread or flour if you're unlucky, and uh, the pièce de résistance, these beans here. Imagine carrying those around all day. Ugh, three pounds of them a day too, I think. <laughs> Yuck. Lucky you. Well, of course, the soldiers of 200 years ago were rarely that isolated from supply lines, unlike the modern foot soldier. Who is trained to operate in small combat units, independent of a rations base and even isolated from water supplies. Ian's carrying a full day's rations in these four packs known as MREs, or Meal Ready to Eat. They're nutritionally balanced, allegedly, almost gourmet food, designed to be readily used and easily accepted by the modern soldier. The food has been preserved and packaged using ingenious methods ranging from freeze dehydration and reversible compression to heat processing. Well, after these mu muslin bags here, the, the package of this is interesting in itself. There's an inner layer in here, which is heat sealable polypropylene and the second layer is aluminium foil which acts as a gas barrier and the outer layer especially strong mylar developed by DuPont. But of course the most important thing is what does it taste like? Simon you get to be the first guinea pig. Thanks a lot. <laughs> What's your Thanks verdict? Um, well there's a unsoggy biscuit and well, the peanut, peanut butter, butter. Uh, it's recognisable. What about the stew? Mm, all yours. Chicken all stew. Yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> this is the US Army Research, Development and Engineering Laboratories in Natick, Massachusetts. The place is famous for developing a number of military defence aids, new materials, new products and processes, many of which have found their way onto the civilian marketplace. 
process is like food irradiation. Freeze-dried food, ready-to-eat meal packs and tube food have all been researched here at Natick, Massachusetts. But if you think that food has already been manipulated about as far as it possibly can, well, we're about to try Natick's version of the food of the year 2000. Not your good old home cooking type food. That probably won't change much at all. No, this is survival food. Food developed for the military, designed to be eaten to go, or more likely on the run. It's designed to have a shelf life of at least five years and to withstand some pretty grueling storage conditions as well. This is a chicken and rice dish. This is a product that has been stored. It's one year old and it's been stored at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And we're looking to see just how acceptable this is. Each product is tasted and evaluated by volunteers from the civilian staff at Natick. Taste, texture, smell and familiarity are all considered important. One of the major problems within the military is in getting soldiers to eat and drink nutritionally balanced meals. Dehydration and vitamin deficiency were common problems suffered by soldiers in Vietnam. It was a problem caused not by a food shortage, but, well, a soldier can only eat so much cold turkey tetrazzini. <laughs> All this food, though, is still largely conventional, but the Natick food research team have produced these little numbers to sustain the soldiers of the 21st century. They're described as lipid bars and, as the name suggests, are 60% pure fat, around 35% carbohydrate and the remainder is protein. They were developed in order to meet a future war scenario where the soldier will operate in isolation from supply lines, fully encapsulated in protective clothing, and all food supplies for possibly five days must be carried within the soldier's clothing. So that each one of these little packs here represents what the modern soldier today is carrying around in this. So that's one balanced meal. And four of the packs represents the maximum amount of calories required each day to maintain physical and mental performance under highly stressful operational conditions. Oh, that's well, right. I can see the walnuts in this banana bar, but mm. I can't see much banana. Actually, the thing I... Mm. Mm. Well, they taste very fatty. I think the one thing the, uh, you could say about them is that if you don't really like them, you could have a shower with them. <laughs> <laughs> very true. Well, as unpalatable as it may seem, this could well be the taste of things to come. The transfer of food technology from the military to civilian life is extremely rapid. Almost certainly, there will be one section of the community hungry to pick up their lipid bars. The long-distance hiker, adventurer, canoeist and mountaineer will probably be sustained by lipid bars hopefully long before the military might even have a real need for them. I think I'll stick to the beans, actually. Yeah. Uh, I prefer the bully beef, actually. <laughs> That's progress. Mm. Give, give me the American Revolution diet any day. After the break, sea otters find a new sanctuary. Okay, here we go. Let's go. The Californian sea otter was once found along the entire west coast of the United States, numbering up to 20,000 about 200 years ago. Wholesale slaughter by fur traders and hunters in the 19th century nearly wiped them out. Fortunately, an isolated colony of 50 was found near the Big Sur in the 1930s. They were all that remained. Today, more than 1,600 survive, from Santa Cruz in the north to Morro Bay further south but they're still on the endangered list. Indirectly, man remains the enemy. Should there be a large oil spill, the US Fisheries and Wildlife Service fear the consequences could be disastrous. Oil clogs the otter's magnificent coat, causing hypothermia and death. 
After five years of research, the Fisheries and Wildlife Department decided that setting up another colony would overcome the threat. Relocation was the only feasible answer. The relocation program is already underway. Over the next five years, it's planned for up to 250 otters to be taken to San Nicolas Island off the coast near Los Angeles. In this $5 million project, the beautiful fishing port of Monterey is the pivot. Specifically, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, one of the finest in the world. It was opened three years ago with the express purpose of preserving the regional marine life, from manta rays to leopard sharks and even the great kelp. The aquarium acts as a holding pen when the otters are brought in from the wild. These four are permanent residents, living a pretty luxurious sort of lifestyle. There's also an ongoing rehabilitation program. Injured or sick animals are brought here for treatment. This unique research is helping scientists understand the behaviour of otters in the wild. And by the way, if you're wondering why I'm not in there with them, well, as cute and cuddly as otters might look, they do bite. What do you think, Roscoe? Me, they bite, but not Julie Hymer, who's been handling Roscoe, Haley, Goldie and Milk Dud since they were pups. Of course, in the wild, otters aren't as approachable, which is why the relocation has to be handled with expert care and attention. 70 otters have made the initial journey south, chosen specifically for their good condition. Females outnumber males by about four to one. Monterey is famous for its marine life, seals, sea lions and of course sea otters. And Cannery Road just down the street from Fisherman's Wharf was the setting for John Steinbeck's great novel. Fishing has long been a vital part of this region, but for the sea otters that's proved to be a big problem. You see their diet is well upmarket, abalone, oysters, mussels, scallops, nothing but the best for these furry creatures. An otter eats about 20 to 25 percent of its body weight in shellfish every day. Some appetite. Those eating habits haven't pleased the fishermen around San Nicolas Island. Skip Ladd, who heads the recovery project, says the otters will be confined to a translocation zone around the island. Those venturing out of bounds will be picked up and returned. Some of the otters are fitted with a radio transmitter in their abdomen, which tracks their movement and behaviour. Coupled with this, a small transponder is placed under the skin of the thigh to assist with identification. It's a strange and perplexing state of affairs. While man and technology represent the otter's greatest threat in the wild, that combination also represents the otter's potential saviour. It will be some time before the success of the translocation can be ascertained. Even with all the money and the research, there can be no guarantees. In 10 years time, if the colony takes hold and, and reproduces well like we think that it will, we would probably see at least a couple of hundred otters at the island. The worst that could happen is that for some reason those otters wouldn't stay there or wouldn't take hold and reproduce well and the numbers might just dwindle down to, uh, uh, to a point where there's not enough there to survive. Hopefully that won't happen, and these wondrous creatures will be eating, grooming, and just lazing around on the Californian kelp for as long as it takes us to grow tired of watching them. Model trains bring out the child within us all. But for the most part, it's a hobby for the serious adult enthusiast. So I guess it was only a matter of time before the computer chip was railroaded into the system and the whole thing went digital. What you're watching is an entire setup running automatically. Locomotives are uncoupling and joining up with the other carriages, the cranes loading containers, and all the trains are definitely running on time. The new system has been designed by the West German company Marklin. 
Actually, they're the oldest model railroading company in the world. Most importantly, though, it allows many trains, up to 80 in fact, to operate on a single track with each train individually controlled. I can enter a designated number for the loco into this control 80 system or throttle control and only that loco responds to that command. So I'll just show you that. For one, turn the functions, which is the lights, on and away it goes. Now that's the ice train, or a model of the ice train, the intercity experimental from West Germany. Now while that one holds its speed, I can punch up another and control another loco on the same tracks from the same throttle control. Here we go. Here we go. The brains of the system is the central unit here, basically a mini microprocessor. This gathers commands from the throttle control over here and sends the signals out on just two wires down to the switches or points and then over here to these decoder panels. Okay, we just stop that now just with one button. Each loco has a decoding chip inside. I can just show you that. There it is in there. The chip decodes signals from the track, which control its speed, direction and various functions such as light and smoke. This keyboard here also plugs into the central unit so that the switches and signals can be programmed in and changed at the touch of a button. Have a listen to this. But the digital railroad has another dimension. The keyboard and control panel can be dispensed with and the entire system can be controlled from your personal computer. Now you have to write your own relatively simple software and then you're rolling. Now I can punch up the number of the loco, which is 08, and then uh, I can control the acceleration by pressing A and then braking by pressing B. It's model railroading for the computer age. A truly fascinating development. But that's enough hobby for one day. So for this Casey Jones, it's time to do some serious work. What have we got? Ah, uh, meetings, meetings, and more meetings. Up next, extraordinary uses for supercomputers. From the very earliest days of flight, new concepts were tested by, well, just giving them a go. If they worked, well and good. If they didn't, then, depending on whether or not you were flying the plane, you went back to the drawing board. But as aircraft grew more and more sophisticated and expensive, Testing new design concepts became increasingly the province of wind tunnels, where innovative but possibly dangerous ideas could be tried without putting the lives of test pilots and expensive full-scale aircraft at risk. But for modern air and spacecraft, wind tunnels have their limitations. They can't, for example, duplicate for long periods the extreme conditions of hypersonic speed and near vacuum which the aircraft of the future will encounter. So designers of future aircraft, including the so-called Orient Express, the 18,000 mile or 30,000 kilometer an hour aerospace plane, can now turn to a computer to fly the craft through the most hazardous of environments in perfect safety. And at the same time, obtain accurate information about the craft's performance capabilities under conditions that otherwise would be impossible to duplicate. The computer that can perform these tasks, the only one in the world, one of staggering speed and power, is the latest addition to NASA's Ames Research Facility just outside of San Francisco. It's the world's most powerful computer, the Cray-2. Ten times more powerful than the previous world's best, the Cray-1. More powerful than 100 IBM mainframe computers. 2,000 VAX 11780 computers of the type used by universities. Or 50,000 personal computers. The Cray-2 has two gigabytes, or two billion bytes of memory, 
equivalent to the entire contents of a suburban library. It processes information at a rate of one billion computations per second, enabling it to do in a few hours what a VAX university computer would take 10 years of continuous running to achieve. The Cray 2 is to be part of a national supercomputer network through which more than 250 scientists and engineers from almost 30 organizations, universities, aerospace industries, defense and other government research centers across the United States will have direct access to the system via cable and satellite links. The machine itself, although relatively small, contains 15 miles, about 24 kilometers of wiring. It achieves its incredible processing speed by packing the chips in closely. But crowding and high power generate a lot of heat. So much heat that the chips must be run totally immersed in fluid, an inert fluorocarbon fluid which carries the heat away more effectively than any other method. The new computer system is known as NAS, N-A-S, for Numerical Aerodynamic Simulation mainly because much of its initial operating time will be devoted to aerodynamic research and what is known as CFD, or computational fluid dynamics. The computer's speed gives it stunning capabilities in the field of computer graphics, providing scientists with a unique and accurate view of what effect different conditions have on an aircraft in situations which would be impossible to observe except by computer. Here, for example, is how particles flow over the space shuttle as it re-enters the atmosphere at an angle of 25 degrees and a speed of Mach 8. That's 6,000 miles or 10,000 kilometers an hour. And this illustrates the pressure patterns. Here, airflow over an F-16 fighter, traveling at under the speed of sound. For a closer look at exactly what happens to the airflow over the wing, the computer just zooms in. It can also show the pressure changes on an oscillating fighter wing at Mach 0.9. Air vortices around a rotating helicopter blade. The flow of hot gases through the manifold of the space shuttle's main engine. It can even look inside the contra-rotating turbines of the experimental unducted fan aircraft now being flight tested by NASA to give what is known as a hot streak analysis of the airflow over the turbine blades and then help improve the design of the blades. But probably the most exciting task for the NAS computer system is its role in the design of America's aerospace plane, the Orient Express, a plane that will be able to take off from conventional runways and yet reach Mach 25, 25 times the speed of sound, fly into orbit to resupply the space station or ferry astronauts, engineers, and maybe one day, even tourists into space. A civil version of the Orient Express could fly from Los Angeles to Tokyo, or from Sydney to London, in two hours. The speed at which the plane will be flying, up to five miles or eight kilometers every second, will generate enormous heat, over 2,000 degrees Celsius, and pressure on the aircraft's skin. No wind tunnel can duplicate those conditions. So before the first test aircraft, the X-30, can be built in the 1990s, the simulation work on the NAS computer system will be crucial. The new computer system is intended to be something of a pathfinder in demonstrating supercomputer capabilities for governments, universities, research establishments and industry. And in addition to its aerodynamic research, it will be used in computational chemistry, for example, to help scientists visualize the composition of subatomic particles and to create otherwise impossible visions of human cellular biology and deadly viruses. It will be used to model the complex weather patterns of our planet and in astrophysics to gain a greater understanding of distant star systems in our own galaxy and beyond an unequal tool with which to probe the limits of human knowledge. Up next, an Australian breakthrough in magnetic imaging. Anthony Marshall has leukaemia. Every six weeks, like all adult sufferers of the disease, he is subjected to this, a painful and traumatic bone marrow biopsy. A needle as wide as a match head is worked into the breastbone. Then slowly, very slowly, the bone marrow is drawn out to be analysed. 
Until now, it's been the only way to monitor the progress of his disease and the success of the treatment. Okay. But in a remarkable world breakthrough, a Brisbane research team has developed a more accurate cancer probe that's faster, safer and painless. And it doesn't even touch the skin. This is a magnetic resonance imager or MRI machine and it's using a magnetic field to look inside my leg. But it's no ordinary magnetic field, it's some 50,000 times more powerful than the magnetic field of the Earth. We were going to demonstrate that power by holding a spoon next to it, but I've been told that any metallic object in this room can become a deadly projectile. So this is the next best thing, the room next door. On the other side of the wall is the MRI machine, and as you can see, it still emits a very strong magnetic field. If the wall wasn't here, these objects would hit the machine at 160 kilometres per hour. It also plays havoc with electronics and magnetic tape, so we're recording this on film. And of course it's a no-go area for pacemakers, watches and credit cards. But having said all that, it's perfectly harmless for human flesh. What it's doing to my leg is making the nuclei in every molecule point in the same direction. Atomic nuclei spin constantly. If you apply a strong magnetic field, they'll all start to spin in the same direction. Zap them with a radio wave and the spins are jolted out of alignment, only to realign when the radio pulse stops. As they return to their aligned state, they give off a small burst of radio energy. The key to MRI is that different chemicals give off different radio signals. A computer detects these signals and presents a map of the various chemicals within the body. And here's my leg. Here's the muscle, the bone and the bone marrow, and what I'm told is a normal distribution of fat. Such an image has been available for over five years, but until now, no scanner has been able to pinpoint a tiny area of tissue and analyse its chemical composition. This is where the Brisbane team has made its breakthrough. It can zero in on an area as tiny as one square millimetre to see what's happening inside the cells. So let's zero in on my bone marrow. By punching in the appropriate coordinates, a computer provides a graph that shows the chemical makeup of my marrow. It has a peak of fat, but once again I'm told that's normal. Healthy bone marrow has fat, but no water. But a graph of another patient shows a water peak, which indicates leukemic cells in the bone marrow. Professor Dodrell and his team devised a method that jams all radio signals, except those from the required target area. To be able to examine the chemistry of such a small part of the body without an incision is of enormous importance to the medical world. Currently there are, there are no other techniques where you can non-invasively assess what's happening inside a tumour inside the body. Um, using these sorts of procedures we can uh, rapidly establish whether that particular tumour or area of tumour is in fact being successfully treated by the drug. This is a highly toxic poison and it's used to fight cancer cells. Inject too much and the side effects can be lethal. Inject too little and the cancer may spread. Thanks to MRI, a doctor can now assess the success of a treatment just 12 hours after the drugs have been administered. In that way, a doctor can fine-tune a patient's medication, so they're given no more of this than is absolutely necessary. The team is now working on a full-body version of the machine. Perhaps one day, your local GP will use this technique as part of your regular checkup. The potential is enormous, and not just for cancer and leukaemia patients. It could provide the answers to some of our most puzzling diseases, like multiple sclerosis. And perhaps most importantly, it will mean less pain for people like Anthony who are already suffering. After the break, taking off in the centre of London. This is the Dash 7, a small airliner which can operate out of short strips. That's not so unusual. What is unusual is that this plane is setting itself down in the heart of the London Docklands, with water on all sides. The London City Airport is a postage stamp-sized strip close to the heart of a major city. 
Unlike Heathrow or Gatwick, it's only six miles, about 10 kilometers from the center. In theory, this means a business traveler could halve the flying time between London and Paris. And this could be the way we'll be traveling in the 21st century. Not with interminable journeys out to the airport, but catching a plane close to the city itself. The city airport is going to change the way we now travel by air. But even more remarkable is the way in which use has been made of derelict land. The really amazing thing about London City Airport is that it's slap bang in the middle of London's East End, surrounded by warehouses, high-rise flats and cranes. In fact, the runway itself is literally the key in between two dry docks. One of them over there is the Albert Dock, the other one the George V Dock. The George V Dock, in fact, forms the apron of the airport. That's where they park the planes. What they've done is literally build a concrete raft supported by piers over the water so that the planes are standing over 35 feet, say 10 metres, of water. From the air, the new London airport can be seen as a strip in between the Royal Docks. The runway itself is 1,100 metres long, which is quite long enough for the Dash 7, so far the only aircraft certified to use it. It's also one of the few aircraft which can achieve a seven and a half degree approach. At ground level, you start to realize how hemmed in the airport is by buildings. Six large cranes have to be moved so they wouldn't be in the flight path. At the end of the runway is a warehouse now to be floodlit at night so the planes can see it. Behind the terminal are council flats, now double glazed. Captain Harry G made the first trial flights into the Docklands five years ago. Now he'll be flying a regular daily service for Brymon Airways. The aircraft is designed specifically for this type of operation. Very high lift wing, which allows uh, low approach speeds. Propellers that go into reverse thrust, give you a short landing. And uh, <coughs> the whole... Uh, the whole idea of this airport, uh, runway lengths, etc., has actually been designed around the Dash 7 aircraft. But the airport isn't the only new development in the Docklands. It now has its own driverless light railway with connections to the London Underground, which snakes its way through the Docklands from Stratford to Millwall. On all sides of the line, there's new development, from newspaper offices to television studios. And ultimately, this railway will serve the airport. Brian 1002, Roger, you're cleared for takeoff runway 28. The surface wind now 2708 knots, and the QNH is 1016. But because the airport is close to a residential area, the number of takeoffs and landings is restricted to 120 a day. There's no flying by helicopters and light aircraft. Even using the Dash 7, it'll be possible to fly to many cities in Britain, as well as Brussels and Paris. And the check-in time, even for international flights, will be short, only 15 minutes to get on the plane. So, London has an airport in the city. But the concept of city-to-city -city air travel is only really going to work if other European cities, like Paris, follow suit. At the moment, the Canadian Dash 7 aircraft is the only plane allowed to use this runway, although the airport's under pressure to bring in jets. All this, I guess, is good news for the travelling businessman, but bad news for the people who have to live next door to airports. Well, that's the show for this week, and indeed it's our last magazine programme for the series. All of us have enjoyed the past year. We've traveled over 800,000 kilometers and to more than 25 countries to bring you the stories you've seen on the show. And as usual, our reporters are spread all over the globe already, filming stories for next year's series. How are yours going, Jeff? We hear you've been doing some work with pigs. We're calling the story Pigs in Space. Well, I mean, what else could we call it? Well, I'm up here in the top end in Darwin and uh, Dmitry Andropov, who uh, is one of the contestants in the AMP Beyond 2000 Science Awards, has been showing me around. And uh, it's been a pretty hot, steamy sort of day up here. Don't forget to be watching the AMP Beyond 2000 Science Awards next week to find out who the eventual winner will be. 
And Amanda, where in the world are you? Well, Chris, at the moment I'm on Tokyo Bay and I'm on board a boat that's guaranteed not to make me seasick. That's quite a tall order. I'll know this afternoon whether it's worked or not, but you'll have to wait till next year. So I'll see you all when I get back. And where are you, Carmel? It looks great. Hi, Ian. I'm on location in Tahiti, currently filming a story about the world's most sophisticated and luxurious computer-controlled yacht. Someone's got to do all these tough assignments. How's it going over there, Simon? Well, Carmel, so far so good. We've been to the world's only school of drag racing in Florida in the USA, the world's most modern airline terminal in Chicago, and now I'm standing in front of the world's most expensive building. But to find out what it is and where it is, well, you'll just have to wait and see. Well, now to one of those sad moments where we have to say goodbye to someone who's been an integral part of the Beyond 2000 team for the past two years, Sharon Nash. And Sharon, we've compiled some of the highlights of your past two years with the program, and we'd like you to have a look at them. <laughs> I'll be sailing aboard this beautiful schooner, the Sea Gypsy. feel a tremendous amount of motion. And the smell, well, there isn't one. Good night, house. a house to fit you and your environment. It's a race for technology. Or perhaps you think about the old west. all this have to do with technology, you ask? <laughs> what a party. <laughs> party girl, eh? <laughs> Great. Well, Sharon, we're certainly going to miss you, but uh, I believe that you're going on to, to some pretty good things. Yeah, I am Ian, um, but this two years has been the most exciting in my life, I think, and um, That's so great. I appreciate well, thanks, that. Sharon. Good luck. Lots of luck. <laughs> good luck, kid. <laughs> good luck, kid. Well, the show goes on. Next week, we present the AMP Beyond 2000 Science Awards. Young people from all over Australia will be competing for the group, junior and major prize with some really wonderful inventions. So join us for all the action and excitement. Until then, it's goodbye from all of us, wherever we may be, here at Beyond 2000.